very pleased to welcome Oscar Munoz to speak here at the Wings Club Foundation. Oscar was named the CEO of United Airlines in 2015. He joined the Board of Directors of Continental Airlines in 2004 and after the merger has served on the Board of United Continental Holdings since 2010. With their combined worldwide network, United Airlines and United Express operate more than 4,500 flights per day across five continents. Prior to his appointment at United, Oscar served as President and Chief Operating Officer at CSX Corporation. He has held strategic and financial positions of some of the world's most recognized consumer brands, including AT&T, Coca-Cola, and PepsiCo. Oscar is also active in industry associations as well as philanthropic and educational organizations. He serves on the University of North Florida Board of Trustees and the Pappas Advisory Board of Vanderbilt University. Please join me in welcoming Oscar Marunos. Oscar. Hi, everybody. I've got uh, an interesting conversation that I'd like to have with everyone. You know, every time you do one of these uh, e-sessions, it's always a little difficult to figure out exactly what to say. Uh, it's quite the uh, interesting audience, uh, different people from different sectors, uh, competitors in the room, industry vets, suppliers, the media, <laughs> um, Wall Street's here. But um, I thought I would say, you know, it's been about two years since I took the helm at United, as Scott says, and uh, while that may seem like a bit of a blink of an eye to a lot of you, uh, I can tell you, uh, I've personally learned enough in this two-year two time period to fill 20 years of experience. And, and, and part of that, that massive overload of experience is important because you learn from that. And I think the learning is what I thought I would share today. And I don't want to be overly presumptions is that what I have to say and the things that I've learned are so profound that they will have massive impact on you and your life. But I can tell you that they have worked. And, and so by way of telling a story, you know, on a Thursday afternoon in New York City, uh, I thought I would just go through the last couple of years and put some big general headlines around some of the issues that we faced, I faced, how we've approached them, and things that we've doing in the journey that is United uh, today. And so I, I also have to say thank you to this industry. It, and first of all, well, gosh, there's so many people that I would love to thank. Uh, it has been one of the more embracing industries that I've had a chance to visit with. Uh, not only our suppliers, uh, our, our partners, even our competitors. I've made great, long-lasting friendships in a very short period of time due to the fact that we are generally you know, a customer-oriented industry, and as such, even new entrants like myself get, uh, get warm. So I thank you all for all of that great comfort and embracing of, of somebody from the outside, uh, but most importantly for a lot of the general guidance. I always say to folks that sharing is caring. Um, and a lot of you have shared a lot of your points. There's a lot of customers in the room, and part of our early process was to learn and listen from a lot of you. And I always say that if someone's willing to share with you, they still care. And that's been part of the journey. Uh, and so as, as, um, as I tell you our story, my simple objective is for you to connect a little deeper with who we are as United, to learn more about us, and to understand sort of the mission that we're on. And, and again, I don't presume anything I'm going to say is move markets, move mountains, but I do want to, uh, as I tell my story, differentiate between two basic common journeys, if you will, when you talk about business. There's a creation journey, and then there's a transformation journey. I've had the good pleasure, as Scott outlined in my history, to work with very large legacy companies, uh, from AT&T to PepsiCo to all the different things that I've had a chance to do. I've always had the pleasure of working through a transformation journey. And that's different from a creation journey. Creation, there's a lot of new creation going on, right? We've got all of the things, technology, we've got, we've got some new airlines starting all over the world, and it's always fun to be part of a creation journey because it doesn't really matter what you say, it's just sexy, right? It's just new, and it's exciting, and, and people, especially Wall Street, tend to believe the projections of some of these things because it's new and exciting. Tesla is probably another good example uh, of, of, of that. Transformation journeys are very, very different. It requires the massive work to change human minds, human intellect, human desire, human engagement and passion in a way that's very difficult to do with, in our case, 90,000 people across a very global spread of physical locations. 
And so transformation also requires a constant feeding of that journey because as I project, as my team projects where we're going forward, generally the world around us is skeptic, goal. Right, we say, yeah, you know, old company, they'll never do things the right way. And so I'm very conscious and constantly focused on making sure we feed the things that we're doing along our journey so that people, in essence, begin to believe that in fact the things that we're doing are happening. It may sound to you a little bit like, um, well, like bragging about who we are, but I feel in a world of transformation, you have to constantly say the good things because there's always instances, there's always occurrences, and there's always happenstance that affects large transformation-oriented companies. We had an event just a couple of months ago that sets a new tone and can derail all the efforts and trajectory of what you're doing. You can't let it happen. That is but a small juncture in the larger scheme of things, and the path that we're on at United is one that I think is very, very exciting for us. So, um, because we're in a constant state of transformation, uh, and, and we've been in a business that's long, as long as you know, commercial aviation itself, and so turning that around is a pretty large endeavor, and we are certainly closer to the beginning than to the end. And so I want to make that perfectly clear. Nothing I say, I say, yeah, we're done, this is great. Uh, it's, always, it's always a process. And so, but I'm extremely, extremely proud of where United is today uh, as a company and our trajectory. And that success story, plain and simple, is the thanks to our 87,000 people that work with us every day and work with you as customers every single day. And some of them who are here with us today. So thank you for all. So everybody raise their hand from United. Um, oh, wow, we really packed the crowd. <laughs> Um, but to consider uh, where we are today as a company, you really have to take, um, uh, you know, the whole story as, 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 uh, as the past over the past few uh, years, I guess. To a degree, I think our journey at United is emblematic of the arc that the rest of the industry has had over the last 10 to 15 years. Things have progressed nicely. I used to be on the board of Continental and then the board of the, the, the joint companies. And so I initially came into the industry back in the day when, well, there was no money to be made and there was no money to be invested. And so the issues that that created going forward are something that's very deeply embedded in my history. I've not forgotten the pain and suffering that the employees and, and vendors in this industry have suffered over the many years. And that is a driving point as you try to transform a company. You have to deal with that human level of, of, of uh, dynamic. Uh, the lessons that, uh, lessons, things that I've learned over the last couple of years, uh, I think have something to teach me, certainly us and our company, and possibly some of you in the, in the, in the, in the, in the room today. So I wanna share a few of the big takeaways with you. Uh, there's a story underneath each one of these. I'm gonna do it in sort of a chapter or headline, just to hopefully make it a little more entertaining and amusing, um, or boring as the case may be. But, uh, but our, 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 our mission is very clear. Customer service, close the margin gaps, and become the best airline in the world. It sounds trite, it sounds, oh my God, everybody says that. Yeah, everybody says that. Um, but who's gonna do that? And I think that's the biggest differentiator that I have to, to offer for you, because simply put, um, how we're becoming a better airline for our customers, our employees, and everyone we serve is, is the key component. How you combine all of those factors, all of those constituents in your going forward position. And so when I first arrived, the, the first um, initiative, if you will, or objective I took was to some degree changing the conversation at United from what had become kind of a what's wrong with United, right? That was the conversation. You know, what's wrong with this? The merger isn't working. You don't have this. You don't have that. And trying to, to change that conversation from what's wrong to more of an exciting and energetic what's next. And so we undertook uh, initially some very low hanging fruit. You know, brought back snacks, improved the coffee. Oh my God, I'm not a coffee drinker, but boy, is that a passionate conversation for people. Uh, so we brought all that back. And, and now uh, we roll out Polaris in a big way because it was important to our employees who had to have nothing, nothing to celebrate for such a long period of time that it was important for us to begin to give something. Uh, one of the big uh, stories that came out initially as I toured around our system, we had a flight attendant who telling me one day, just in tears, she just said, I'm just so sorry, Mr. Munoz, for having to say I'm sorry. 
I'm sorry the Wi-Fi doesn't work. I'm sorry we don't have coffee. I'm sorry we don't have snacks. So it was that part of the interesting first few weeks where we began to undertake sort of a, a bit of a transformation with regards to that. Now, coffee and snacks does not a culture change. It's not an industry or business trajectory change. New had a lot more to do than that going forward, and that's the work we are starting to do that. But um, as often happens, uh, life gets in the way. And uh, I had a medical uh, situation that occurred 37 days into the job. Uh, unexpected, certainly. Uh, unwelcome, clearly. Uh, one of my doctors said I was muttering something as I was being wheeled into ER. And uh, I, I always tell, tell the story because it is, it is me to some degree. I kept saying, as I was in near death situation, basically, I don't have time for this. I don't have time for that. <laughs> Um, but the headline for that is, is just because your heart stops doesn't mean the world does. Um, and so, you know, long story sick, I got sick, I, I got better, and I got back to work. And in early 2016, uh, I was back in the office. Uh, I still had some devices and, you know, still had some things to work through. Uh, I actually had some news that I couldn't tell anybody at the time. But um, we had started on our path forward. What I had started before I left and what had been working for the, the couple of months I was out we gathered the entire leadership team to basically depict what's our North Star, what's our path forward. We need something more prescriptive and more defined rather than we're just going to make things better for people. And so uh, as we sat around um, uh, over the course of that, uh, that first week in January of 2016, uh, right before we broke for lunch, and a couple of you in the room, I think Jerry Latterman was here, there's a couple of folks in this room. Uh, right before lunch, we actually came to, the, the, you know, after all this thought and consternation about what was our next big first step, and, and it was not about the, the tools or the investments or the strategy or the network or all those things that you would have us say. We fundamentally determined that the biggest problem United had was that we had lost the trust of our employees. I'll, tell, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but for some of you in the room, especially the more capitalist, market-oriented folks, it's like, really, you had a meeting and that's all you figured out? Um, in a world, in a business that's people to people, um, it was a very critical uh, conversation. Quick sidebar story. It was interesting that we were having this sort of life-altering decision about going forward to where our company was going to be focused in the next, you know, the next uh, time period. Because what the team didn't know, and what I had been on for a couple of weeks, was on a list for a heart transplant. And the morning, that morning, that very first morning, which it happened to be my birthday, by the way. Uh, you don't make this stuff up, I'm telling you. <laughs> uh, a doctor had called and said, we've got a kick-ass heart for you. And so he goes, and it's, but I don't have to go into the afternoon, so like, what do I do? It's like, well, let's go to the office and let's go to the meeting. And we had the meeting and I acted like nothing was going on because uh, it was just what we do. Uh, and uh, so right as lunch broke, I said, hey, guys, I'll be back in a week or so. I've got some things I've been waiting for. And Because all of this stuff is secret, right? And yeah, move, that moves markets, and so we had to try to be quiet. Um, and then I said something um, that I didn't mean to say, but I said, I'll see you on the other side. And so, ladies and gentlemen, it's wonderful to be on this particular other side as rather than the other side that it might be. <laughs> <laughs> so when I returned to work, uh, after the transplant, which was really kind of a week and a half later. I know the press says it wasn't until March or something, but I was back in the office pretty quickly. It's amazing the technology that allows you to, to do these things. But, but we had to move on that big initiative of trust uh, and re-engage our employees, as well as many, many other things that, that we had to do. So we were starting to get back to work. Uh, it was gonna be on a limited time frame, but we were gonna get the, the team back and working. But again, um, events have a way of dictating to you rather than the other way around. So. Uh, I label the next chapter in our story after one of my favorite uh, Rolling Stone lyrics. You can't always get what you want, but sometimes if you try, you get what you need. Now, I understand, I've been told that this song, one of my favorite songs, has been used in the recent political campaign. But I just want you to know, it was the song I asked for and what was playing as I was wheeled into surgery for my transplant. So it's my damn song, <laughs> I'm gonna continue to use it. <laughs> um, so listen, we got back. Incredibly full inbox, lots of things to do, as you might imagine. Uh, we, ha we had, an, gosh, the inherited uh, operational issues, serious customer issues, and frankly, in investors doubted me personally uh, from my background and history and now my medical condition. I think the lifespan that was, I was being given, it was in months. Um, 
year and a half later, I'm still here. <laughs> uh, and so, and coming from outside the industry was also a concern to folks because I was saying words, saying things that either they felt were naive or destructive. I used the words like disruptive. We had to stop being docile. Why do you use disruptive? Because it's the opposite of docile. And somewhere in the middle, we're gonna end up as good business people, but it had to project something to our team and our, and, and our folks of forward movement rather than the same old thing. Uh, so uh, we had stopped a lot of the federal investigation that we were going to, and then, uh, then we had a proxy battle. Um, life just is so much fun sometimes. Uh, and the proxy battle had all the issues, your board is horrible, you know, the whole things that we went through. Uh, now, I just happen to be a veteran of proxy battles. Uh, uh, one of my favorite banks is here, Evercore, and they've helped me, and JP Morgan is here too, which also helped me through uh, a couple of those things. Um, and there's, there's things you learn when you go through proxy situations, and everything's different, so this is not mean, you know, meaning to give advice to anyone. But there's, there's a whole array of things that you can do. There's the one which I find that it's a logical step. You go through the whole entire process, gnashing of teeth, spending of money, destroying each other's credibilities and background and history, and taking it to a vote and getting whatever comes out of that vote. While it's illogical to me, it's illogical. There's another path that I learned from my first experience, and Eduardo, Eduardo, where's Eduardo Mestre? Is he here, Eduardo? No, you were here earlier. No, he missed the plug. Um, he and I had learned this from the, our previous organization that sometimes early on in the process of a proxy, you can make a determination that certainty, you can both decide what you're gonna settle on, is better than the uncertainty later, and you avoid months of distraction, cost, and frankly, uh, an operation that was already fragile was gonna go worse. And, and so I kept telling my message to the, the people on the other side, to my board, and everyone internally, and we ended up you know, basically you know, settling things in a way that was quicker, better, cheaper, and most importantly, it allowed us to get back to work as soon as possible. So at the end of the day, I ended up with six new board members, three which I've chose, three which the other side chose. We all chose everyone together to some degree, very highly credentialed, very highly capable, and they've been an incredibly engaged uh, process of our strategy development. So happy to have them on, and so you got past that. But again, the lesson is sometimes uh, you can make the good, the the enemy of the bad, or whatever that saying is. I always forget those things. Are, so, all right. So, uh, so, so then we have this board put together. Everyone's excited, and now the next chapter has to come into play. Uh, and so I put this board together, and then the next complaint, next missive, next conversation that's happening, usually in the media and, and to some degree Wall Street. You haven't got a team in place. You haven't got the right team. You got to make some changes there. It's like, yep, uh, got it. So we went about, you know, methodically. Uh, you know, stacking our bench and our C-suite with um, what I consider, and I think a lot of people consider, an all-star executive team. Uh, from across industry, uh, across different DNAs, big legacy companies, small startup companies, uh, but I am more importantly beginning to gel that team together to create a good working functional team going forward. This industry is interesting in the fact that uh, everything, everything in history seems to revolve around a single person that runs an airline the names, and we all know the names in history, and I won't mention them here, because I'll miss one and I'll get in trouble. Um, I don't believe that. Fundamentally, it is not about me or one other person. It is about the team that has to come together to do that. And that's, I think, something that's gonna be a different approach to solving a very large issue that is United, uh, because it takes more than one mind. Uh, I know some of us think we're, we're smart enough and capable enough, we've taken all this stuff ourselves, it, it, I think it's too difficult and too tough and not necessarily enduring because what has to happen in a transformation is that the change and the progress and the trajectory has to continue after that person is gone. And sometimes, oftentimes, if you think of the history of this airline, it hasn't lasted because the power of one person is just so great. So I'm about all about building a team and I don't care the level of caliber and, and concern and, and now the complaint I get by and large is, ooh, you have too many people and there's too many. It's like, Okay, that's my problem now. I have too much capability, too much horsepower. That, I'll take that any day. And my job really is to harness that energy and, and put it in the right direction and then watch them go. And watch them go, they've really, they've really done a, new, a, a great thing. As the new team has come together, we've developed a, a, a long-term strategy that is, is, I think, very loud and very clear. Our, our top financial priority is simply to improve not only absolute but relative margins versus our peers. Um, we're committed to rebuilding our network. 
everyone's always said that the puzzle that is the United Global Network is something that no one has actually been able to solve. I think I have the team that knows how to do that. And I think a lot of people in the industry, you know, gnashing of teeth aside, realize that we do have one of those best teams. Um, and so we have a lot of potential and we're starting to grow upon it. Um, we're being really thoughtful because some of this requires growth and growth is not often something that's well received within the investor community because of the history. Too much capacity creates, you know, creates a, a subpar demand and yields go down. I understand that. Our, our growth is not a testosterone lace growth aspect as some people have said, to reclaim market share and our rightful place. This isn't the Middle East, this is business. And rather than being, it, it, for us, it's, a, it's a simply a financially driven exercise to improve our network and our margins. And we are completely confident that United has, uh, I think, unique levers that we're pulling today that we haven't been pulling in a while. I used the word docile before. The company was docile in its approach to its marketplace. And we're taking advantage of that and making it slightly more assertive. And again, there's no spreadsheet anywhere. There's no concept that says we're going to regain this natural share. It is just taking adva advantage, taking in full utilization of the resources and assets that we currently have. So doing all that, but at the end of the day, at least something certainly for me and most of my team, my continued and never ending focus is to maintain an engaged workforce. I I'm telling you, without that, there is nothing we're gonna accomplish. There's nothing we're gonna ap approach that we're gonna be able to accomplish. With them, we can accomplish basically anything. And that is my true fundamental belief over many years of transforming companies in my history. And it's something I, I'll, I'll stick with for a, for a long time. So we can achieve all of these things. And that leads me sort of to kind of my next um, chapter, uh, which is simply the way to do this, the way I have approached this. I said I'm a transformation guy. I've done it in massive companies for a long, long history. The railroad was the last example. Who's heard of railroads until Basically, we started working through railroads. We took a, a you know, six billion dollar market cap company at CSX, my former company, and made it a 45 billion market company. And guess what we did? We got around to listening to people, learning, and then leading. So that's my next sort of learning or, or, or um, uh, focus: listening, learning from that listening, and then leading. Because when I joined United, I did that. Just, it's just simple. I just I went anywhere and everywhere that somebody would have me and listened to everyone about everything that was going on. And, and it was interesting because while it may sound easy and trite to do that, oh, you walked around and talked to people, yeah, um, but you really have to have the patience required to truly sit and focus on someone's words and deeds. People will open up to you if they feel that your question is a genuine one. I've seen this done so badly when people walk around, they have fancy suits, you walk into break rooms, you walk into the ramp, you walk into any kind of these places and you walk and you smile and you shake people's hand and you can't wait to get the hell out. You have to sit your ass down, you have to stop and you have to connect with human beings in a way that carries. In our business, the, the speed of information that happens with social media and the internal communique that is our company is infinitely faster. If we could ever tap that, if somebody could ever figure out how to make that work across all other companies, we'd all become billionaires in, in making the app that does that. But today, the only method I know is to get my personal physical body into the right place talking with people and customers. And that's what listening is all about. Learning from that and then, and then taking the time and patience to then lead. So I took that first initial thing and it just completely substantiated what we had learned before I went out for my transplant that we had truly lost the trust of employees because I had to force people in some ways. I'd sat in front of them. People sat and spit at me and yelled at me and with the, the, the passion that you can't imagine. And people around me would get nervous because of that. It's like, oh, someone's gonna hurt the little guy. <laughs> Back to sharing is caring. The louder you come at me, the more I am thankful that I still have you. Because that level of passion doesn't come from anger and disconnect. It comes from I still care about this company. I still care about you. And I'm still going to give you the information. So that's what we went about in doing. And then the initial things that we did, again, sounds so simple and trite. Because once you listen and learn from that and then do something, that something had better be focused, had better have a, um, a, a level of, of application to the people you just spoke with. So our first investments, our first big decisions were stupid simple. We solved some system issues. That's not that simple. We, we up, upgraded 
you know, break rooms. We, we, we got more ground equipment, ground service equipment, all stuff inside the family because that's what people told us. It was one, Jerry, I think you were there with the ice cream. Right? Somebody just, you bring us ice cream, then you don't bring us a damn refrigerator to keep it free. So the next day, Jerry had the complete autonomy to buy, uh, you know, an $80 uh, sort of small refrigerator to put the darn, right? But that's what listening and learning is. And that's how you build a culture of really, truly caring about your folks. So sounds easy. It isn't as easy as you think, and you really have to live that over the course of time. You have to live that personally. So um, all the while doing that, I always have things that are working on multiple levels in my head. You could see what the biggest issue that we had at United. We hadn't solved for labor contracts, and that had been going on for some period of time. There's a lot of you know, consternation, and, and people want to know, why are you settling these contracts? I think I was called Santa Claus for a while for... Um, yeah, imagine me, Santa Claus, uh, giving, you know, giving everything away to anybody that just hey, he's taking care of his employees, and other, he's just giving everything away. He's going to create this level of chasm that's unsustainable, and that business is going to go down. What people don't understand, and I came from a very heavy union-organized uh, department for both to, uh, telecom and the railroad space, the hidden cost, the hidden cost of discontent and inefficiencies due to unintegrated and unhappy labor unions are, are tough to quantify. They really are. But strongly believe that it's the most important part of our product today and our company and our people. It is just that structured. And when Wall Street constantly asks, why are you spending, it's a billion dollars of investment we made in getting those contracts signed. Getting those contracts signed in the right way with the right balance of labor rules and, and, and application. So we did it in a thoughtful way. But yeah, it costs money because I saw that the pride and professionalism that was embedded in our organization was as deep and as hard as you could possibly imagine. And in order to tap it, in order to really get it working for us, you had to do the right thing. And so we just went and did the right thing. We didn't give away the farm necessarily. We had tough negotiations. It took me the most part of a year. But right before December, I was remember exactly when we signed the final one. And so, you know, to use a, a line from the Godfather on, on that particular day, we kind of settled all the family business with regards to labor. And, and so I'm, I'm proud to, you know, to say that we managed and included all those things. And I now firmly believe we have some of the best labor relations. And, and, and certainly, and as you fly with us, I think you will attribute this, some of the most engaged workforce that we've had that are supportive. And despite recent events aside, it just galvanized this team to do that. And so we're now ready to tackle a couple of our next big objectives. Uh, one, uh, I have to lead with because it's, it's, it's timely and, and it's you know, treating customers with the highest level of service and the deepest sense of respect. It was a tagline that I used in, in writing to many of you as our, our frequent flyers with regards to a note of apology for the event that happened on April 9th on flight 3411. Um, many wide, broader stories and lessons there, but, but primarily the takeaway lessons uh, for me is that my initial remarks fell short, and I own that. But my subsequent remarks, or some of concurrent remarks with regards to supporting the men and women of our company for doing the right thing a lot of the times, I got a lot of criticism for that as well. And ladies and gentlemen, as I stand before you today, I will never, and I say never ever, retract that statement because the support of 87,000 people for me was critical because I knew, like many things, over time, things pass. And when things pass, I could do it in an easy way, blame other people, move it around in different areas, push it the other side, in essence, blame other folks. I knew that after the fact, I'd have to live with whatever we did. So the personal pain, the slings and arrows that you suffer as CEO sometimes in these events was absolutely worth it because how we came out of this with our people still engaged, if not even more engaged in delivering even more as, you'll, as I'll tell you in a minute with regards to the metrics that we're, uh, we're providing, uh, was very critical to me. So um, in, in days of social media and uh, the velocity, all of those conversations that we can have at some point in time, but for me, uh, the lesson was that we have to get deeper, a deeper sense of customer service. And again, I don't have time to go through a lot of these things, but the three pillars that we're basically following are very simple. Customer service means a lot of things to a lot of people. Um, the layperson will say the kind of quality of coffee or dessert or meal, and they'd be right. Wi-Fi, you know, there's a thousand things that people want from a customer service perspective. A lot of you in this room know that primarily what people want in our business is frequency, schedule, and cost. Right? And above that, safety, and the last one, which is reliability. Our work, our efforts, solving labor unions is all about getting reliability. 
Because when you get people to where they want to go, I called you, I went to your website, I, ordered, <laughs> I, I, I signed up for a flight to go from point A to point B, and it's such a time for this amount of money. That's what we signed up for. The more you deliver that very basic sort of contract, the more your customer service level goes up, right? I mean, I can serve the best filet on a three-hour delay flight, and guess what's, how happy is someone, is someone gonna be? But uh, what we do, and the hard part about our business is that you know, 99.97% of the time, we get people where they want, safely, efficiently, and on time. No one writes about that. They don't, they just write about the things that are not. And when you fly 86, 87 million people all over, the, all over the world every single day, those absolute numbers, the percentage of a, of a large number can get to you very quickly. So um, our big customers, so reliability, continuing on that mission. The two others are the ones that are toughest. The second one is flexibility. We are somewhat of an inflexible organization. Uh, industry, I shouldn't say organization. We've been steeped, at least at uh, United, for 96 plus years in a focus of safety. Safety and the regulations around safety are simple in the sense that they require discipline and rigor. Structure, no leeway, right? Because that's the way you want safety to be. We've taken that philosophy over time and just applied it and moved it over into our customer service area. We have a lot of rules, a lot of protocols, structured and disciplined, which is why our gate agents do what they do sometimes. That's the rule. You board people, you do this. You know, somebody comes in late, wants to board an earlier flight, the rule says no. But there's empty seats. The rule says no, right? There's no, there's an intractable aspect that's been born out of a culture of safety. So you want that safety, but we have to get more flexible in that regard. That is a little bit more difficult to do because I've got lots of people in a lot of places that have been steeped for 20, 30 years in doing that. How do you create more of that leeway without creating anarchy and chaos? Because what you'd love to have is like, yeah, everybody come, sorry. Uh, get, you know, jump on the plane, you know, everybody just come on on, come on in. We have to have some structure, but how do you balance that structure? So reliability, flexibility, then information. We just have to get better from a systems perspective of letting you know when things aren't going well. It's just as simple as that. And it's, uh, that is the hardest thing you could possibly imagine because we have things to worry about like air traffic control, mother nature, um, and so so we're working on those things, and, and the things we've, you know, we've, we've announced with regards to customer service are not the finish line. They're just you know, basically the foundation, uh, but we're moving on. The other premise behind customer service is always back to the journey of transformation and how you ha have to kind of constantly feed that, that journey. Uh, with regards to uh, a commentary that I always use is you have to allow for proof and not just promises. Um, I'm an old CFO guy, and uh, you know you make all these conversations, all these presentations in front of Wall Street all the time. I would go and sit when I wasn't in my own meetings and watch and listen to all my other counterparts across my industry, across other industries, speak. And and for all of you that do this for a living, it, it's uncanny and unnerving how often we all say the same exact damn thing. It's just a different color, a different brand, but we're all promising the same things, and this is going to grow, and no, this isn't going to be an issue. And so from back then, I started adjusting my commentary or conversations to just make it a little bit of something different. And so my premise from that has been proof, not promises. It's like, sorry, listen, okay, you don't believe me. We're just going to gradually begin to feed this transformation journey with simple proof points. And so what's wonderful about that is that, you know, we're not... We are, the things that we're doing today are things that we said we would do some time ago. And it's a competitive business. I'm a competitive guy. That scared people. People wanted me to concede that certain other airlines were just beyond our reach. And I'm not conceding anything, not because I want to be this. It's like we didn't know what the potential of our airline was, and I didn't have the team to unlock it. Now we know the potential. We're beginning to feel it, and I have the right team. And we've already projected sort of margins improvement of a, of a nature that are beyond what people would have expected of us with specific and clear plans and a general belief that we have the team to put it in place, which is why our stock has gone up 84% over the last year, right? So markets do speak. And so we'll continue to do this, but the thing I'm probably most impressed, proud of, is that this improved morale and engagement is leading to real factual things that benefit you as a customer. Our operating, um, performance in 2016 was record beyond records. 2017, we continue to just kill it. The team is doing wonderful across all these areas. And we, as most of you know, in our industry, in the domestic space, our hubs and our, the, some of the best business markets, but we have the most traffic, we have the most 
weather, we have the most everything. We, we are not always in the, situated in the right perfect place, but despite all those things, you don't hear us complain. You just hear us deliver. And so whether it's got to completion factor, baggage handling across that metric board, uh, all of the things that are related publicly in April during the event that, that concerns uh, so many of us, we, we finished first in the nation. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what I call proof, not promise. Morale, engagement, people, focus, strategy, talent around it to support that. And, and so our, our engines are really starting to fire on all cylinders, except there's one thing that's literally slowing us down. And that leads me to sort of my final headline or chapter, which is, or my headline, I've used the term, it's like driving Ferraris on gravel. And that refers to, um, it, it's a metaphor for our industry in general, but because reliability and safety are better, we're more profitable than ever as an industry, and you know, the fall in price and fuel has is, is help, helped everyone, and we're investing billions in these incredible aircraft from all the aircraft manufacturers in the room. We are literally buying, and, and they're building, and we're buying some of the most incredible souped up, quote, Ferraris in the system. They really, we really are. But this outdated, outmoded, and hopefully outgoing air traffic control system that we have in America uh, is literally like driving those Ferraris on a road of gravel. That's the, the impact of that. And so the issue that is becoming now politicized with regards to privatization of air traffic control, I change that term all the time. It ain't about privatization. It's about modernization. Simply is that we need to do something. We've been trying, and, and to all credit to the FAA and all the thousands of people they employ and some of the best air traffic control people in the world, it's not about them. It's about the bureaucracy that it's inherent in a large governmental outfit. The, continue, the, the continuity of funding to manage something of this scale and scope, to get leading edge technology, to get the people, the human beings that are capable of building something like this, it's just, it's hard for any one of us to believe or support that that's gonna happen inside of a governmental agency. That, and as you talk to them, they're as frustrated as anyone. Every time they go to the next round of funding, we just don't know. And so the, what we're trying to promote, and, and, and certainly thank Secretary Chow for her support and, and the rest of the, the administration, um, it's not about a political privatization move. It's about the right thing to do. Everyone else has done it. 50 countries, right? NAV Canada's been doing it for, you know, 10 years. Uh, you know, less cost, 50% more throughput. Britain, 50, again, 50. so there's models out there that can be done. Now, privatizing, doing it, it's not the simplest thing. I'm not naive to think that just give it to us and we'll fix it. It'll create some issues, but I think it creates a level of certainty. So air traffic control is, is one of the big issues that we face, and we'll work through that. But, um, but those are my general thoughts. And that's my beep, which I finished on time. See, I thought of that. That's pretty good. <laughs> Again, I, I, I hope you um, understand my, my need to communicate with people is, is to be as simple as possible. And I'm never as structured as people would like me to be. I, I, I hate the concept of sitting on your end and listening to somebody read through a whole host of things, um, you see a, a little bit of an unfettered me, and as you meet and you know some of my other teammates, uh, they are equally as um, free to speak their mind. And I love that, and that's what's gonna change, and that's what's gonna transform one of the great brands in this country, which is United Airlines. So thanks for having me. And, uh, we do have time for a couple questions from the audience. Um, on the flexibility uh, issue that you raised, saying that, you know, making clear that that is a very difficult um, in this industry, not just United, how long do you see that transformation on flexibility taking? It'll take, um, it, of course it'll take time because it'll never end, but we've already made some, some changes in that and uh, we've got a whole round of changes that we're going to be announcing over the course of the next few months. So it'll be a continuous one. Uh, there's some that are easy to do or easier to do, and there's some that are more difficult. Uh, but it has to be a constant focus, right? And when you put a tag like flexibility, it gives our organization uh, something to work from. Rather than some structured, strategic thought process that's so cluttered, um, I have 87,000 people that work the line all the time. And they just want, it's like, hmm, I want to need to be reliable. I personally need to be more flexible, and therefore I'm gonna force you, Oscar, and your team to allow me rules and protocols and procedures that allow me to be just that. 
and then we all want information. So it's just, you have to break it down as simple. Of course it's much more complicated, and of course it takes a little bit of time. But I think you'll see the progress, not only with us, but I think the rest of the industry is also feeling a lot of the same after effects of that event. And uh, it, it's, it's sad that an event like that has to happen uh, to sort of accelerate the progress that I think most of us are already on. But uh, we're moving on it expeditiously. Hi, Oscar. Uh, Edward Russell from Flight Global. I wanted to ask you about uh, the status of the Avianca joint venture. I believe there's an announcement coming shortly on that, and then uh, how that will change United's competitive position to Latin America. The, uh, the ongoing conversations with not only Avianca, but all our global partners is something that uh, we, we value the partnerships across and around the system. Uh, we've not finalized anything with regards to our partners at Avianca, but we have a, a great working relationship and we work, look forward to continuing that debate or that conversation. How's that for skipping that one? <laughs> All right, fabulous, thank you.